Hello, and welcome to ASC's webinar series. I am Jennifer Goss, ASC's Medical Education Specialist. Today's webinar is titled Reimbursement Updates, including the new strain code 93356. Before we get started, I just have a few housekeeping items that I would like to go over with you. There will be no CME offered for this webinar due to the content. Since this is a live webinar, you have the opportunity to have your questions answered by Dr. Michael Main and Ms. Denise Garris. To ask a question, use the questions tab on the left-hand left side of your screen. Feel free to ask a question at any point during the presentation. However, keep in mind that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We will do our best to ensure that all questions are answered. However, this may not be possible depending upon the number of questions presented. We will post the Q&A uh, to the enduring vor version of this webinar next week. And finally, if you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you can click on the Request Support button in the lower left of the player, and ha we have a technical expert there to help you out with whatever problems you may have. Without further delay, let me introduce today's speakers. Dr. Main serves as chair of the St. Luke's Physician Group Cardiovascular Division and as co-executive medical director of St. Luke's Mid Mid-America Heart Institute. He is a professor of medicine at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine and a practicing cardiologist at St. Luke's Mid-America Heart Institute. Dr. Main is a graduate of the University of Iowa College of Medicine. He completed his residency and fellowship at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas and an Advanced Cardiac Imaging Fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Ms. Garris has over 20 years of experience in analyzing the global healthcare environment, educating physicians and practices, and advocating for physicians before regulatory agencies. She is certified as a professional coder, ICD-10 proficient, and a recognized coding expert. To date, she has collaborated on over 120 CPT code change applications, resulting in the creation of over 340 separate and distinct CPT codes, in addition to 11 HCPCS applications for new products and 22 revisions to HCPCS descriptors. It is our pleasure to have Dr. Michael Main and Ms. Denise Garris with us today. Well, thank you, uh, Jennifer. So I think everybody on this call is probably aware uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services issued a final rule on November 1st of this past year that includes updates to payment policies, payment rates, and quality provisions for services furnished under the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. And these took effect on January 1st. Some will take effect somewhat after January 1st. Uh, as a part of that, and with the budget neutrality adjustment to account for changes in RVUs as required by statute, the finalized calendar year 2020 physician fee schedule conversion factor is $36.09, a slight increase from the 3604 conversion factor in 2019. Also, as part of the uh, uh, final rule, CMS elected to adopt some evaluation and management coding changes recommended by the American Medical Association Current Procedural Terminology Editorial Panel for Office and Outpatient e and Visits. These changes will take effect in CY 2021. They include retention of five levels of coding for established patients, reduction in the number of levels to four for office e and visits for new patients, and a revision of some code definitions. A key issue for echocardiography is a new Category 1 CPT code for myocardial strain imaging, and that CPT code is 93356. This is a new code, as I mentioned, it replaces a previous tracking or Category 3 code for myocardial strain imaging. That was 0399T. The new code took effect on January 1st, and the definition, the CPT editorial panel definition, is myocardial strain imaging for the quantitative assessment of myocardial mechanics using image-based analysis of local myocardial dynamics. This is an add-on code for base transthoracic services, and as part of the approval process, 
CMS reviewed the RUC recommended work RVU and practice expense inputs, which we'll see on the subsequent slide. Uh, both the work RVU of 0 0.24 and related direct practice expense inputs were accepted. And this is now an active code for both in-office and HOPD services. And this is exciting in the ECHO world since this is the first new ECHO technology to achieve CPT editorial panel category one status, meaning Medicare reimbursable uh, in over 10 years. As I indicated, it's intended to report strain in conjunction with various base transthoracic echo procedures. These include 93303, 04, 06, and 08, in addition to the stress echocardiography codes 93350 and 51. This should be reported just once per imaging session, and additional uh, uh, details on that are available in the AMA CPT uh, code book. Uh, there are no restriction on clinical indication for use of this um, code. Shown here is the uh, components of reimbursement in the non-facility, uh, in other words, physician uh, office or the facility setting, uh, an HOPD setting. In the non-facility setting, the total RVUs are equal to 1.12. Reimbursement is in the range of $36 uh, to $40. In the facility setting, the total RVUs are 0 0.34, reimbursement of around $12. And the next slide breaks this out. In the non-facility or physician practice setting, the professional component is 0 0.24. The practice expense uh, component is 0 0.87 RVUs, accounting for things such as the software necessary to provide or to, pro to produce strain imaging, and then a small uh, male practice component as well for a total RVU of 1.13. Uh, for reasons we can get into in the Q&A in the HOPD or facility setting, reimbursement is essentially only for the professional component at 0 0.24, so a total reimbursement of around $9 per imaging session uh, in that setting. It's important to note that when the strain code, when the tracking code or category three code was first uh, approved, strain was used mostly in the cardio-oncologic uh, setting. Since then, of course, indications for strain have expanded. There are no restrictions uh, for use of the category one code with any indication. Of course, now we're using this to characterize cardiomyopathies and then essentially all patients uh, with unexplained uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So with that, uh, I will turn this over now to Denise Garris for some E&M uh, coding changes updates. Great. Thank you, Dr. Main. Uh, so we wanted to talk quickly about the E&M coding changes that will actually be taking place in calendar year 2021. The reason this is uh, we're talking about this now is simply because these are a massive overhaul to these codes that have not been changed for over 25 years. And we'll take a step back and just think that these codes that were um, originally produced by CMS in 2018, there was a, a lot of pushback and CMS has finally adopted what AMA is putting forth in these services. Again, this is not taking place till January, 2021 and ASC is providing, looking forward to providing a full education for members on a monthly basis, sort of updating you and giving you information as it becomes available for us for, so you can implement these into your practice. CMS did in the final rule accept the AMA proposal, which basically will revise the definitions of certain services. It will delete CPT code 99201, provide updates to the guidelines, change the way component scoring is actually done within the code set for established, both new and established patients, and then also massive changes to the new medical decision-making table. These are big changes to look forward to and to really make sure that your practices are ed educated on because it will change the way that time is counted for E&M services. Uh, I think it's also important to note that CMS did not adopt the changes for the global surgical packages as they continue to evaluate the data in those surgical packages. So um, as you can imagine, there are some folks that are happy with the E&M changes and some folks that are not happy with the E&M changes. 
So we will continue to update um, ASC members as we see what is happening in the practice settings. Uh, so I think this sort of goes over the same thing that they will continue to adopt, uh, adopt and evaluate what is happening with the reimbursement. You'll see here on the next slide the echo in the final rule for the fee schedule. Uh, these payments remain relatively stable, and it's important to note this because these changes will be taking effect in calendar year 2021 with the E&M services. And with that change, that will be a change to payment rates. So E&M services, as you may have heard, will go up in value. And that means that while these values for echocardiography services will remain stable, the conversion factor will change and these payments may drop for echocardiography services. So while your practice may see an increase on the E&M revenue, they may see a decrease on the echocardiography revenue based on just due to no changes that they've actually performed, simply because there will be a change in the conversion factor. Other changes to look forward to that were in the Medicare final rule were a change from the quality program uh, Medicare loves their acronyms, so they're changing the MIPS uh, program to an MVP program. MVP is essentially the Merit-Based Incentive Program Value Program, which is intended to remove barriers to engaging in advanced pra uh, practice management programs and promote value focusing on quality and cost measure improvement activities. Additionally, they will update proposals for 2020 performance year, including uh, increased performance thresholds from 35 to 40 points, uh, performance, um, exceptional performance of 85 points, and additional weighting for services such as interoperability at 25%. CMS is also looking at other issues within the, pay the quality payment rule, such as um, increasing their threshold for submitting quality data and um, looking at the QCDR data points, which ASC is a membership of. All this information is available on the ASC website and we'll provide additional input there because this is a very dense program which has a lot of changes coming forward. We should look now at the hospital outpatient payment rule, which was released again on November 1st and they were not many changes for echocardiography services, but many things that we were watching within the payment, uh, the payment updates that were taking place. See, they did implement President Trump's executive order to improve and protect Medicare to our nation's seniors. Essentially, what this meant was that Trump would like to look at, uh, Trump and the administration and the agency would like to look at um, additional ways of improving transparency within pricing of these services, encouraging medical innovation, and empowering patients to understand what is happening within their services. The site neutrality issue, which continues to rage on, and we'll begin uh, you know, showing how echo services are performed both in the hospital outpatient setting and the office setting. They're looking at ways in which they can determine if there are ways to have prices publicly available so that patients would understand them, so that you could look at what are you being paid, what are physicians being paid in the office setting and what are they being paid in the hospital outpatient setting and what the variances are in those services. This is an ongoing issue that in which there are several legislative and lawsuits pending against the agency on how they're actually implementing this. So while it continues to be an issue, which we are watching, we are watching um, to see what also happens with the things that are happening in the background, both legislatively and on the legal side. These are issues which will obviously impact at the delivery of echocardiography services, but we have not been included in the site neutrality proposal at this point in time. It is just one thing that we want to make sure that we are aware of in case our codes do come up into this process. This uh, slide shows the variation in payment rules uh, for the APC payments, which are the technical component payments of the services that are provided in the hospital outpatient setting. As you will notice, there are slight variations um, within the payment rates, but nothing grand, uh, no, no great changes were made. The APCs remain the same. The, the variation that is based on the movement of services in and out of the APCs 5523, 5524, in addition to the process of um, 
the amount of services that are being paid completely under the hospital outpatient setting. Again, as above, this is the, the slight variations are based on the services that are in and out of those separate APCs and the charge submissions that take place within the whole APC payment system. Some things that we are watching on the horizon on the payment side of things. Um, many of you may have seen the drastic cuts that were proposed for myocardial PET imaging and the physician fee schedule. Um, that was proposed in the proposed rule, not in the final rule. Um, these cuts were up to 80% of the technical component, um, which was a huge hit to the community of the SOATs who would perform those services. Uh, in the final rule, CMS uh, pulled back on implementation of that information and determined that it needed to review and care, review the information further and carrier price these services. It puts a burden on claim submission as well as the negotiation rates that they have to do with the individual payers because there is no national payment rate for these services now. Uh, the reason we bring this up is that um, many of you are probably aware that our echocardiography services recently went through uh, RUC valuation, and it's just things that we are kind of keeping an eye on to see what will happen as CMS implements these new work and practice expense inputs in the light of the changes coming with ENM and all the other services and moving pieces within this process. And with that, I think we'll pause and see if we're moving forward to questions. Okay, um, this is Jennifer again, and uh, Dr. Main and Ms. Garris have sort of uh, anticipated what questions you may have, so I'm going to go ahead and ask some of those, and then we'll get to the ones that uh, the participants have, have asked if we have time. Um, so the first question is, how should we bill strain when performed in the HOPD thing? Well, in the HOPD setting, we should submit the new code when strain is performed, 93356. Uh, but as we uh, mentioned earlier, there's no technical reimbursement in this setting. This is a professional uh, uh, fee reimbursement uh, only uh, at this point. But yes, the code should be submitted when strain is performed. What code should you bill, 0399T or 93556 to report myocardial strain imaging? Yeah, the 0399T was a predecessor code describing myocardial strain imaging. That was a tracking code at the time that uh, the ASC and the ACC made an application for strain several years ago. Uh, strain really wasn't being performed in multiple centers and there was less data available now for the clinical utility of this service. The new code 93356 has replaced and supplanted the 0399T, which was required. So don't use that code anymore, only use 93356. How often should 93556 myocardial strain be billed per study? Yeah, this should only be used once per imaging session. What echocardiography services can be billed with 93556 myocardial strain? Well, this is a code, it's, a, it's, a, it's an add-on code, and it is, so we can submit this with our base echocardiography services. We went through those, those will be available in the Slides, but essentially 03, 04, um, 06, 08, and then the stress echo codes as well, 50 and 51. Okay, I'm going to move over to some questions that, that the participants have, have uh, submitted. When chemo patients come in every three months to have echocardiogram performed with the strain imaging, are we to do a complete 2D echo or should we be performing limited studies on these patients? with the strain imaging? Well, I think the answer to that depends on your particular lab protocols and uh, the question that you're trying to answer. I think in most instances, patients that are being followed on therapy, for instance, patients on Herceptin, which we perform echoes on a every three month basis on therapy, these are typically limited studies that include some quantitative method for LDEF, either contrast-enhanced 
by playing Simpsons or a 3D derived LBEF in volume. And uh, we would then, of course, also add strain imaging uh, as, as well to that uh, examination. What are the specific documentation requirements for CPT 93356? Denise, why don't you go ahead and take that? So I think the, the documentation requirements that we have said is the obviously medical necessity for those services. In addition, you need to put include um, what the outcomes were and what you are going to be doing with that information once you have completed the strain and what impact it has to patient management moving forward. So all of that needs to be documented in the medical record. Is strain billable in combination with echo with contrast? Yeah, there's no restriction on that. Okay. How do you document medical necessity for justification of the strain imaging CPT coding? Do you functionally build strain on all TTE or just in selective coding? If we need to be selective for cardiac oncology, valvular, known cardiomyopathy pathologies, how do you design a technician-driven workflow to maximize strain implementation? Well, I think that has to be a part of your lab protocol. I think this is similar to what many labs, including ours, have done with contrast have standing indications, and of course, most of those are based on ASE guideline statements, have standing uh, orders in place, uh, and then implement those on a daily basis. We obviously should not be performing and reporting strain in every patient. I don't think that that is, uh, is, is what we ought to be doing, but we do know that there's an expanded list of potential indications where strain can help answer clinical questions. Uh, but I think it ought to be part of your lab protocol and in, in many instances, part of standing orders for specific diagnoses or indications. Is there any physician payment for 93356 for inpatient TTE? Well, the professional fee will be submitted and that should be reimbursed uh, typically uh, on, on those studies. Obviously the, the, the technical component, the uh, imaging itself, uh, will be rolled up into a DRG, but the physician work should be reimbursed in that setting. Should the facility bill for the new strain code even though the payment is bundled? Yes, they should. Uh, we should be submitting. Yeah, Denise, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, so I was going to say, yes, they sh should actually be billing for the strain code because the hope is of the prospective payment system that eventually the payment would be caught up in the, the, the base procedure. Do ordering providers need to specifically indicate myocardial strain imaging on echocardiogram order to get reimbursed? This will depend on your on your um, health system, your your facility. In some cases, the way we have handled that, the way we've handled other add-on codes, is uh, through protocol and through standing orders. Denise, I don't know if you have any other comments on that. No, that was great. Thanks. When prior authorization is required for TTE, does 93356 have to be included in the PA request or can it be added to a TTE with PA? Typically, that could be added on uh, to the uh, already authorized study. What CPT code should we use for follow up? <laughs> Can you repeat that, Jennifer? What CPT code should be used for follow-up visits? I assume they're referring there to, again, to the strain code, and the same code should be used uh, on uh, each imaging session in which strain is indicated and performed. Okay. What is the final input? in-pocket reimbursement for the institution? Well, as we went over, it's, it's, it's different, obviously, if this is a physician office practice versus a hospital outpatient department setting. For a physician office practice, the total roll-up is going to be around $40 uh, in the HOPD setting where professional fees only 
uh, apply, uh, it was going to be about $9 per imaging session. For the doctor, is there a specific narrative that must be added to the final conclusion on the ECHO report concerning the performance of strain? Well, I think as Denise mentioned, the more documentation we provide, uh, the better. What we have done is indicated in the findings that strain was performed. We usually indicate what uh, um, uh, platform and software revision were used, the results of that, and in the conclusions, how that basically uh, impacts our final impression. Does this code require offline performance of strain or could strain at bedside on machine be utilized? It does not require offline uh, analysis by the physician uh, at all. It's not required. What indications can be used for 93356 in order to be approved by the insurance besides chemotherapy follow? Well, really, as, as, as we mentioned, there's no restriction on this uh, uh, at this point. The code was initially designed, obviously, with all of the interest surrounding cardio-oncology and the vignette for the code descriptor described a cardio-oncology patient, but uh, there are no restrictions on that. And as everyone, I'm sure, on this call is aware, the indications in, in which strain can be clinically useful are expanding at a pretty rapid rate. Um, this is Denise. I would just add quickly that we also recommend that you check with your local payers. So um, their policies would be the ones that would drive that. What is the price to send to the insurances for the CPT code 93356? Denise, do you want to take that? I'm not I'm sure that I understand that question. Sure. I think um, the, the best way to look at this is that we would we cannot recommend a price for practices to bill because it's something that they have to feel comfortable justifying to the payer themselves. We would obviously, as you have a copy of these slides, look at the prices that Medicare is reimbursing for the services and determine what price you would like to do based on the contract that you have with that payer. And private payers typically follow Medicare's lead. Correct. If the technologist does the strain imaging, but the doctor does not mention it in the report, can we still bill for it? Also, does strain imaging need to be in the heading of the ECHO report? I would not recommend um, billing for anything that you did not comment on in the report or uh, integrate into your final impression. I think Denise probably agree with that. Absolutely. Do you have a sample of what the report looks like documenting strain? You mentioned including the software results, et cetera. Yeah, and we do that. We indicate the software revision and the platform that we use. That's purely for our clinical use, just because we know that there are some intervendor uh, differences in strain values. So I don't think that needs to be reported for uh, you know, billing and compliance. You do need to report that you did it, what the results were, and how that's integrated into your final impression. Will private payers reimburse 93356? Time will tell on that. I think we would uh, hope and assume that many of them will follow uh, CMS's lead on that. Okay, okay. Um, another one is, is this CBT code uh, to be used for pediatric cardiology as well? Denise, you wanna feel that? So it is available for the base TTE pediatric codes. So it could be used if medically necessary. For facilities that don't own the physician practices that are doing the interpretations, Will they, the facility, receive any reimbursement for doing the measurement, or would only the physicians see reimbursement? Yeah, I mean, if it's an HOPD setting, regardless of whether or not the physicians are integrated with the health system, wouldn't make any difference. There won't be any technical reimbursement uh, in the facility setting. If you try to perform 
screen and you document that you did the work, but the value was unreliable due to suboptimal images, can the code still be billed? That's a good question. Denny, I, I, I would say you could submit it, but uh, uh, I, I would think that it could easily be denied. Uh, Denise? I, I would agree, especially if there's going to be a need for a, a repeat study or something of that nature. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, we can end today's session. Uh, I want to let you know that we will post the questions and answers next to the Enduring webinar next week. Um, you do have the availability to um, have the slides under resources. Is that right, Vincent? Uh, it should be under resources. Um, and thank you everybody for participating in today's webinar and a very special thanks to Dr. M Michael Main and Ms. Denise Garris for presenting on behalf of ASC. Be sure to keep up to date on future live webinars by checking the ASEU University homepage. Thank you again and have a great day.